And a few lovely fans in the audience, thank you. <laughs> how lucky am I to be director of this college and how lucky am I to have students like we've had here today performing. Haven't they been absolutely magnificent? <laughs> So individuality is a very, very important part of being at Bradfield and self-expression. The reason many of the students come here, we're a senior high school and so we, we specialise in the creative industries, but the reason people come here is because they don't fit into mainstream schools. It's that traditional box, that traditional school curriculum and these students just don't fit into that. Um, they are often disenchanted, often demoralised when they come here, but they're also highly creative and highly undervalued. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you saw the story, Emily Ray, 17-year-old musician from the UK, she was banned from sitting her A-level exams because she dyed her hair an unnatural shade of red. There it is. Now, my first thought when I read this story was, she'd fit right in here at Bradfield, as, I'm, as you've no doubt seen by lots of the uh, colourful people walking around today. Um, of course, I understand, look, it, you know, it didn't take long to see that there were a whole lot of other lists in the, uh, in the press of students who'd been banned from events for wearing shorts, another for a boy who wore a dress, and of course, lots for their hair. But to ban a student from sitting their A-level exams, I think that's just pretty sad. Of course, I understand that schools have rules and rules do need to be obeyed, but really encouraging creativity and encouraging self-expression is far more important. Emily Ray, she's a musician. She said that for her, the hair colour was a confidence thing. And if she had to dye her hair back brown again, she would lose that confidence. I understand Emily. She's a lot like many of our students here, as I said, at Bradfield. And making creative students stay within a box is tantamount to torture, which is why so many creative students fall through the cracks or simply feel very lost in those senior years of school and certainly in those first few years out in the real world. I also know this because I'm a creative. I really did dislike school. I hated being boxed in. I can relate to Emily except that unfortunately at her age, I didn't have a particular talent. I did play the viola, but judging by the reactions of the dog and the neighbours, <laughs> was never going to go far. I could sew, but I wasn't a seamstress. I could write okay, but I was never going to be a brilliant author. Yet I had a thirst to create. My mind bubbled over with what ifs, all the great what ifs that led me down creative rabbit holes. And if I was in an environment where I couldn't explore the what ifs, I would become frustrated and stressed and anxious. I wish I'd known then what I know now. One of my big light bulb moments was when I was working in airline entertainment. So after the flight attendant gig, I actually worked on the ground in airline entertainment. That's a pretty cool industry, I have to tell you. I was part of a large cross-functional group with Qantas and British Airways who were pushing to introduce seatback videos for the first time back in the early 90s. You can thank me later. <laughs> The group was made up of an incredibly diverse bunch of people. So we had software engineers, cabin crew, IT, uh, avionics engineers, marketing, and myself responsible for the entertainment product. Now, because we were such a diverse group, we didn't always see eye to eye, and those meetings often were derailed in frustration about what we were trying to achieve. So before it ended in tears, we ended up doing some professional development. Um, it was a personality test, you probably know the kind. Uh, they test how people react to others, how they re in, you know, react with the world, how they take in and process information, and how they um, make decisions. I guess it was all about team building and understanding each other. The different reactions from the group at the time were priceless. The aircraft engineers thought it was a complete load of rubbish. But when I received my results, that light bulb shone so brightly for me that I could have powered the entire aircraft fleet single-handedly. Now, the difference between us was also very clear. This is the personality profile of your average aircraft avionics engineer. 
quietly systematic, factual, organised, decisive and concrete. Now, they're all attributes we would like in an, av in an avionics engineer, I'm sure you'll agree. I, on the other hand, was the polar opposite. Highly creative, insightful, focused on possibilities, novelty-seeking and playful. Perhaps these are attributes we would not like to see in an aircraft engineer. <laughs> but it was the description of my personality type that was the most illuminating. You are bursting with ideas so fast you can't get them out in time. That's me. You seek to inspire others. Yes, that's me. You can see the big picture and you're always looking at possibilities. In other words, you don't like being boxed in. Yes, all me. Now, this was the first time that I'd actually been identified as being a creative. And I understood that being creative didn't mean playing an instrument or painting a picture. It meant that I finally understood why I disliked rigid environments and routine tasks where I felt I couldn't breathe. I understood why I was frustrated when I couldn't explore the what-ifs. Who's got a creative brain out here? Who would say that their brain is chaotic at times? Wonderfully chaotic. I love my chaos. You know the saying, tidy desk, tidy minds. I don't want a tidy mind. In fact, if my desk is tidy, the hairs start to go up on the back of my neck and a low-level sense of panic sets in. So through that personality test at the airline, I saw that my creative chaos was actually valued and that the engineers didn't think this way and, in fact, they needed someone who did. And eventually, through this project, I also learned about structure because I had to pull down a lot of that, the ideas out of my creative chaos and put them onto the page. It also gave me the opportunity to settle into my creative self, which is why, finally and thankfully, I think I came into education. Now, you probably know the quote by George Bernard Shaw, uh, he who can does, he who cannot teaches. Any teachers out there who hate that quote? <laughs> yeah. It's pretty dismissive of the wonderful creative ability that teachers have, good teachers have, of looking at a pretty boring syllabus and finding a little bit of chaos to spark and ignite interest in their students. Bernard Shaw also said, activity is the only path to knowledge. That's what we concentrate a lot on here at Bradfield, is giving students lots of activity and practical tasks so that they can explore their creative selves. Now, at our school, individuality is highly valued. Students come here because here they're not judged. They dye their hair as a rite of passage. And we know that every student has their own story and we value their difference rather than a cookie-cutter, moulded version of a school's ideal. And we know that there are many, many different types of creative students who all need guidance to find their creative self. Every Friday we have four hours. It's a compulsory out extracurricular program where students learn, it's called industry experience. Students learn about different work options. They explore uh, lots of uh, different avenues about themselves. So it's a bit of self-discovery. But it's four of the most important hours that they spend here on the campus. As you know, we've just moved here. On one, we're settling into our community. On one edge we have a heritage cemetery. And on the other, we have the Royal North Shore Hospital, one of the biggest uh, and busiest hospitals in the city. Earlier this year, a project fell into our laps. Uh, Marily Sintra, she's the director of the Health and Arts Research Centre, contacted us because she thought our students might be able to be involved in a project at the hospital. Here's the project. That's the Hospital Heritage Museum. It's a lot of old cases filled with obscure medical instruments, Dymo labels peeling up at the edges. Try selling that to a bunch of 16-year-olds. But Marilyn knew exactly what she wanted. She wanted to throw open the doors of the museum and let our students in to unleash their creativity. She um, had a brief and her brief was very simple. Bring the stories of the hospital heritage to life. Make them matter to people your age. So our students had a real project with a real client and a brief and a deadline. 
Well, it took our science teacher, Felicity, no time at all to become completely infused, not confused, infused. She, there was an iron lung. She said, that's incredible. She saw a whole bunch of needles and said, we're doing vaccination at the moment. The kids are going to love this. So she took that spark back and ignited it with the rest of our teachers who came back brimming with ideas about what they could do. And because there were no syllabus outcomes, our students were free to completely explore their creativity. So I'm going to give you a taste now of some of the results. Some of you may be lucky enough to have seen our exhibition outside. Please do stop by on the way out um, because some of their works are, are already there. So first of all, our, phot our photography students, they walked down to the cemetery and saw all the graves of young children, uh, some of who died in the influenza uh, epidemic and others in the polio epidemic. And there are uh, a whole range of wonderful Gothic photos of these graves in the cemetery. We let our students loose with the polio virus not the real one, digital images of the polio virus. And uh, apparently it looks like a pom-pom underneath a, a microscope. So they manipulated digital images of the virus and uh, printed that onto fabric and are now embroidering it to make textile art. So there's a couple of them there. Students were intrigued also by the deformities and, uh, on, that the polio virus had and... and uh, they made quite detailed illustrations on the effects on the body, both young people and older people. I think some of those illustrations are quite haunting, quite unbelievable. We also had some budding graphic designers who took microscopes of the superbug bacteria and uh, manipulated them and are currently printing them onto tea towels. They quite enjoyed the pop art irony of superbug bacteria on tea towels. <laughs> um, Photography students took museum artefacts and made still lifes and, and photographed those. Our film and TV students, I just wish I had some of those here today to show you, uh, they interviewed staff down at the hospital. One of the staff members sobbed with passion as she told her story. And for our students to witness and document that was incredibly powerful. Another student is building a 3D version of the hospital museum in Minecraft. How cool is that? <laughs> and there are about 50 other projects, individual projects that students are beavering away at currently. There's a book of short stories, there's another book with illustrations, uh, kinetic typography, which is animated text. And uh, they're all working away for a very large exhibition that's going to be launched jointly with the hospital in a couple of weeks' time. But one of my favourites, be partly because I saw it taking shape, was one of the uh, art projects. The students were asked, they were given a small piece of paper about that big, and on it was a black and white design. They had to scale that up to A4 using charcoal. One poor student got an entire square of black, so that, there wasn't a lot of artistic uh, activity in that, but they were all working away, you know, scaling up their, their black and white images. At the end of the lesson, the 16 pieces of paper were put up on the wall. And an image of Sister Irene Compton, one of the worst nurses from the hospital from World War II, appeared, peering down at them. A real person from the hospital's heritage peering down from the wall. And there's another one here of two other nurses. And these are two that you can go and see in the exhibition just outside. The learning in this project has been profound and relevant on a personal and a community level. The students really had to step up to a level of professionalism beyond their years. Teachers said that the, the most powerful connections the students made were to the, the people stories. And uh, they showed great empathy and intrigue about the patients and the nurses. You see, Marilee and our teachers knew not to box our students in. By giving them a spark and plenty of trust, our students are creating stories that are vibrant and modern and relevant. And that stuffy old heritage museum came to life. Individuality, particularly in senior school, must be valued and encouraged. Because the, the day they walk out of the doors here, they're going to be judged on their individuality. Sure, they'll need their qualifications and that bit of paper, but they're all going to be competing for opportunities and it's going to be their individuality that makes them stand out. 
Creativity is an incredible attribute. It's something that we want to grow in our students, not stifle. I so desperately want to go back to my 16-year-old self and say, hang in there, you'll find your place. By boxing students like Emily in, we are not providing them with the courage to create. And it isn't just about the colour of their hair. It's about how they approach every lesson and how they make decisions. And it's making sure that we let their minds wander and explore all the what-ifs and then have the courage to pull those ideas down and that we give them plenty of trust and freedom to let that happen. Thank you.